Hi everyone, I'm Fatima and I'm a PhD student at UC San Diego and a research scientist with OpenMind. And I'm going to talk about privacy preserving natural language processing which focus on machine learning and deep learning applications. In this talk, I will first describe some of the many applications of natural language processing in our everyday lives. And then I will briefly go over the machine learning in NLP pipeline the privacy threats and the existing mitigations. I will then conclude the talk with the main takeaways. The ultimate objective of natural language processing is to read, decipher, understand, and make sense of the human language. Some of its applications in our daily lives are translation, help with planning tasks, fake news and error detection, email classification, and completion. NLP can be used for parsing medical records and predicting diseases or going through texts and journals and analyzing the sentiments. Now we will discuss the pipeline of applying machine learning algorithms for NLP. First, user data is collected. Then this data is used to train a machine learning model, for example, a deep learning language model. Once the model is trained, it is deployed on the cloud with remote access or locally on the user device. It could be used for different purposes, such as text generation, text understanding, or to create embeddings. Now, what are the possible vulnerabilities and threats in this model? One is if we assume we have a rogue data scientist who has access to the training process. In this case, the data scientist could mount a gradient attack and try to infer personal information from the updates to the model. Or they could attack the trained model or the embeddings and try to extract information from them. Another threat is an external adversary who could query the model to extract private information about the data contributors. Word and sentence embeddings can be used to infer data related to the contributors as well. Embeddings are a type of real valued vector representations that allow words with similar meanings to have similar representations. We can learn embeddings by training an embedding model, let's call it phi. We then feed sensitive information x star to phi and get the embeddings for that input. This embedding can be used for response generation, question answering, and text classification. There are three sets of attacks that can be mounted on this embedding. One is embedding inversion in which the attacker tries to invert the embedding and find the actual sequence x star. The other is attribute inference in which the attacker tries to infer attributes about x star and the last one is membership inference, where the attacker tries to infer if X star or its uh, context uh, X prime have been used for the training of the embedding model. Now let's assume that we have a text generation model and it's trained on private data. Then this sensitive information can be memorized in the model and it can be infer inferred from the model's output. For example, if a text generation model has memorized the credit card number of one of the data contributors, a user of the model might be able to extract this by writing a sentence such as, my credit card number is, and then pressing tap, 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 and then wait for the autocomplete to do its magic. In order to measure this unintended memorization in text generation models, Carlini et al. proposed the exposure metric, which answers the question, what information about an inserted canary is gained by access to the model? To measure this metric, random canaries are inserted in the training data of the language model. The canaries are strings of random tokens. Once the model is trained, the probability that is assigned to different sequences and different possible canaries is measured by feeding them to the model. Here, for instance, we see that if the ca actual canary is 2822, the smallest negative log probability is assigned to this sequence, which is indicated that it has the highest probability. This probability is used to rank different canaries, and then the exposure for each canary is calculated based on the ranking of different possible canaries. The higher the exposure, the easier it is to extract the secret or the secret canary. Now that we have seen some of the existing threats, we will briefly discuss the existing mitigations to help protect against these threats. To do so, I will first brush up on the notions of differential privacy and geo-indistinguishability. Let's assume we train a model using a medical data set that includes Alice's medical records. Now, we train another model without Alice's data. If we want to achieve differential privacy, we should be able to guarantee that the outputs of these two models 
for any possible set of inputs is very similar. To say it more concretely, a randomized algorithm A satisfies epsilon differential privacy if for all neighboring data sets, D and D prime, and all possible outputs by the ratio of the probability of seeing output Y would be bounded by E to the power of epsilon. Let's say that we're in Manhattan and we want to find nearby restaurants, but we do not want to share our actual location. In this scenario, if we use differential privacy with a low epsilon, which means a good level of privacy, the probability that our location is reported to be somewhere in New Jersey is similar to the probability of our location being reported as it, what it actually is. However, what we want to report here is the actual city that we are in, and we just need to obfuscate our location within the neighborhood. So what this means is that we want more obfuscation in a smaller radius around us, and we want less obfuscation as we go further for a bigger radius. This is what geo-indistinguishability provides. As the inequality here shows, we can see that the ratio of the probabilities is bounded by e to the power of epsilon times the distance between the neighboring data sets. This means that we can impose the level of granularity that we want using the distance metric, and we can achieve this relative measure. Now, the notion of geo-indistinguishability is used in a recent work in the context of word embeddings. In this work, the word embeddings are perturbed with noise, uh, with, noise sam uh, with noise sampled from an exponential distribution. This distribution is calibrated such that the perturbed representations are more likely to be words with similar meanings rather than any arbitrary word from the vocabulary. For example, here you can see that for words encryption, hockey, and spacecraft, the perturbed embeddings and the perturbed words that we get if we want to have a high privacy is going to be public key futsal aerojet, and for the lowest privacy, it's encrypt hockey spacewalk. So what we see is that the words for encryption, they are not something out of the domain. It's not like tennis ball, or for hockey, it's like futsal, across. they're all sports, they're all from the same family. So during distinguishability is used to make sure that our perturbations are within the radius that we want them to be, and they're not going to map words to random unrelated words. Now, here if you're going to see a privacy mitigation for the training of recurrent neural networks, and one application of this is in natural language generation and translation. In this method, which is a mixture of federated learning and differentially private deep learning, each user trains a separate model on their own devices with their own data. During the training, the gradients for the, uh, for the model, individual models are clipped, and then the updates are applied. After a number of iterations, these updates are aggregated and then they are sent to the cloud where they are added and then noise is added to them. And the final update is generated for which the central, uh, which updates the central model. Now, once the central model has been updated, it's sent back to all the devices where they continue their training on the user data. In this scheme, since each user is training, their own model and the updates are clipped for each user, user level privacy is achieved as opposed to private work, DPSGD, which targeted example level privacy. There are other mitigations as well, which mainly target sensor data privacy, but can be extended and used for NLP tasks as well due to the sequential nature of the data. Because of lack of time, I will only share their names with you in a paper list, and then you can read them if you want yourself. Here, I've only brought Olympus, which is a method that uses adversarial learning to protect sensor data. There are also works that use uh, encoders and decoders to decrease uh, the amount of information. And I encourage you to also have a look at them. To conclude, I want to emphasize how important natural language processing is and how we use NLP services a lot every day when we're texting, when we're writing emails. And these services are all accessing our private data. So it's very important to make sure that we have safe and trustworthy deployment of them. However, this area is heavily underexplored and there's definitely a lot of room for improvement, both in the sense of the attacks that exist and uh, for the mitigations. Thank you everyone for listening to my talk and feel free to reach me on Slack and also email me if you have any questions or any feedback that you want to provide. Thank you very much.